let me uh, introduce uh, Dr. Shikhar Patranabish. Uh, he is a staff research scientist at IBM Research India. His research interests are in theoretical and applied cryptography with a recent focus on quantum safe cryptography and uh, privacy uh, preserving analytics. Prior to joining uh, IBM, he was a staff researcher at Visa Research USA and a postdoctoral uh, researcher at ETH Zurich, Switzerland. He received his uh, B.Tech and Ph.D. from IIT Kharagpur. He is a young associate at, uh, of the Indian National Academy of Engineering and ACM Indian uh, eminent speaker and a recipient of the President uh, of India Gold Medal from IIT Kharagpur. His research has uh, appeared in top conferences and journals in security and cryptography and has been recognized by an ISCR based early career paper award at uh, Asia Crypt an IBM PhD fellowship and uh, uh, Qualcomm Research uh, Innovation oh. Fellowship. So uh, let, uh, let us welcome the speaker and yeah. yeah thank you for the introduction and uh, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me uh, to give this talk. Um, so um, I want to start with a little bit of a disclaimer. So there are two words here that I think are buzzwords nowadays, crypto and quantum. I just want to start with a disclaimer that this is not a talk about cryptocurrency. And this is not a talk about quantum computing. Um, you know, it could be misleading sometimes. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, about uh, cryptography and uh, sort of the plan is I'll try to give an overview of the work that's happening in IBM research broadly across uh, crypto and security. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about my own work, um, which is uh, sort of, you know, uh, captured in this title, which is cryptoplexity or cryptography complexity. I think we have had a number of really fascinating talks uh, on complexity, but perhaps looking at different kinds of complexity. So I'll try to sort of paint a picture of crypto complexity. Um, and then I'll try to end with a couple of slides uh, just on my research journey, which I think uh, is the norm for this, uh, these kind of talks. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, OK. Um, right. OK, so I think uh, you know most of you have probably heard about cryptography today. I don't know if that would have been the case five to 10 years back when I was starting out with my PhD. but you know, with all the applications of cryptography that we see in real world applications, um, I think all of you are familiar with cryptography. And it has really evolved over the years, you know, starting from like the, the, the 1970s and 1980s when it sort of became an important branch of, you know, theoretical computer science um, to the post 2000s where we see an explosion, right, of applications of cryptography in sort of real world applications. Um, but, but this comes with its own challenges, right? Because when you want to design secure cryptographic systems, um, you, you know, you have to go all the way from designing it in theory to actually implementing it and then protecting it against what are sometimes called as, you know, these implementation level attacks, right? Because cryptographic vulnerabilities could be in, you know, there could be many, many surfaces for your vulnerabilities, right? You know, attackers could be, you know, uh, targeting your assumptions, targeting your designs, targeting, you know, flaws in your implementations. And this leads to an unfortunate scenario because this means that we rarely sleep well, right? Um, so, you know, if, you, if, we, if I screw up in the talk, you know why, because, uh, you know, <laughs> I rarely sleep well. Um, but, but this is really a fascinating challenge in some sense because, you know, when you work across the entire spectrum of, you know, theoretical to applied crypto, you sort of see this whole range of things that you have to do to actually get a cryptographic system to work in practice, okay? And that's something that I enjoy doing. Um, so with that background, I'll probably just give a brief outline of what I want to talk about today. So as I said, I want to talk a little bit about the cryptography and security, the breadth of work that's happening across IBM Research and, you know, in IBM Research India, which I'm part of. I'll then sort of talk about, you know, the main, uh, you know, technical aspects of this talk, which is, uh, you know, this cryptoplexity stuff. And I'll finish with some, what I call as observations of a traveling cryptographer, okay, which are some personal insights that I've gained over the years. So I'll start with the first part. Um, so, you know, uh, IBM research, uh, you know, has a, has a huge presence globally. And, uh, you know, we have around 200 researchers who are working in various aspects of crypto security and privacy. So on this slide, I'm not sure if it's visible at the back, but on this slide, I've highlighted the centers which have people who are actually working in crypto. And then there are other centers where people work on other aspects of security, which could be, you know, system security, OS security, compilers, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, I'm based out of Bangalore. Um, so we have a significant crypto presence uh, in Bangalore, in Zurich, in Yorktown, in Dublin, and, and there are various centers. 
Um, and uh, the kind of work that's happening you know, in IBM research, it, it, as you can see in this slide, it, it's like a huge breadth of things. Um, you know, ranging all the way from threat management to cloud infrastructure, securing data and AI, crypto foundations and decentralized trust. And, uh, you know, obviously if I start talking about all of these, we'll be here, uh, you know, I'll miss my flight and you'll be here <laughs> like for a long, long time. Um, so in the interest of time, what I'll focus on for today um, is just, uh, you know, this vertical, which is, uh, which is something that I have been working on, um, which is crypto foundations and more specifically crypto agility and quantum safe crypto. Okay, and this is something that we are working on at IBM Research India in collaboration with researchers from Zurich, Haifa, and uh, Yokta. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of background because I've sort of mentioned quantum safe and what does that mean. Um, I think many of you are probably aware of the significant advances that we have had in you know we have had in quantum computing. Um, you know, there's there's the there's the possibility, the realistic possibility now that we'll have scalable quantum computing within the next you know 10 to 15 years. Okay, and that's great news. That's revolutionary, but that's not good news for cryptographers. Okay, that's more sleep lost, right? Um, because uh, you know, because what happens is that once you have scalable quantum computing, um, then the landscape of cryptography, right? So as cryptographers, we have built this you know massive looking buildings, right? Um, while relying on essentially the hardness of solving certain computational problems, okay? Um, but what happens with scalable quantum computing is that some of these problems now become solvable, okay? Um, because, you know, you can you sort of drop what we, you can call this like a Q-bomb, right? So you just drop the quantum bomb, you, are, you have a, you know, a computer that's able to run Schwarz algorithm, and then a lot of the beautiful crypto that you have built is just gone, right? It's gone. Now, of course, you might think, okay, but then quantum computers are a long way away. Right? Um, why worry about it now? Okay. The reason why you need to worry about it now is because if the attacker, right, if your adversary, right, um, has the sufficient motivation and resources, right, um, to, to actually do something bad, then they can sort of harvest all of the stuff that you are doing now, right? So they can store all of the encrypted traffic, right? Uh, you know, all of the messages that you are sending over WhatsApp, which are claimed to be end-to-end -end encrypted, for example, or all of the digital signatures that you are doing to authenticate yourself, right, uh, when you are logging into some service, they can sort of harvest all of that, keep it, and later, when the quantum computer becomes feasible, go back and recover all of it or forge all of it, okay, depending on what they're doing, okay. So, the, so even though scalable quantum computing may be further away, right? The longer you use quantum unsafe crypto, the more vulnerable you are, okay? And that vulnerability is now and today. It's a present threat, okay? So what that means is that we essentially need to switch as quickly as possible to using alternatives that are not broken by quantum computers, okay? And that leads to essentially two challenges, um, which I'll summarize in this one slide. The first being crypto agility, which is you know, you may have, for example, we have clients who are running like, you know, huge workloads, right, on IBM's cloud platform. Do they even know where in their workloads crypto is getting used and whether or not it is vulnerable to quantum computers, okay? So this is the first challenge. Even before you start thinking about all the fancy quantum safe stuff, the first challenge is identification, okay? Do you have an end-to-end -end assessment of your crypto assets? Okay, so this is what we call as crypto agility and vulnerability assessment, where you essentially want to help clients with visibility into the vulnerabilities of their crypto. Okay, and this is sort of the short term goal that we are working on, because this is something that is very, very important, right? Even before we talk about shifting towards, you know, quantum safe crypto. And then of course, in the longer term, we want to prepare the ground essentially for a wide breadth of things that are currently quantum unsafe, okay? So for example, if you have heard about things like, you know, self-sovereign digital identity, if you have heard about verifiable credentials, if you have heard about Web 3.0, right? If you have heard about decentralized, decentralization, a lot of that is enabled by fascinating crypto constructs, which are unfortunately all quantum broken, okay? So we, what, what we want to do is we essentially want to be in a position that by the time, you know, um, or maybe well before quantum computing becomes scalable, we are actually equipped with quantum safe versions of these things, okay? So this is sort of a one slide summary of what we're looking at. And uh, this is where I'll sort of finish the summary of what we're doing at IBM Research. Um, are there any questions at this point? Okay. 
Um, if not, then I'll move ahead and I'll try to sort of spend the next few minutes giving a very sort of high level overview of some of the work that I have been doing um, in the space of quantum safe crypto and some relations that it actually has with, uh, you know, cryptography complexity, okay? Um, and I'll sort of start by going back to sort of the fundamental motivation of crypto in the first place, right? So, so why do we need cryptography, right? And I think the most fundamental motivation for that, I don't know, since ancient Rome probably, right, has been that you want to have secure communication over insecure channels, okay? So Alice and Bob want to communicate with each other um, and they don't want like an eavesdropping adversary to be able to see what they are communicating with each other, right? Um, but they want to be able to do it over insecure channels, okay? And fundamentally, the world of cryptography can be broken into two parts. There's the symmetric key world and the public key world. In the symmetric key world, there's this additional power that the parties have in the sense that they actually have this sort of costly but secure channel, okay? Over which they can maybe sort of, you know, transmit short messages, okay? And maybe they can use this to exchange like a, sh like a small key. And then after that, they can just use that key to go on and, you know, communicate over insecure channels, okay? I think the colors are maybe not that clear here, but the secure channel is the one in green on the top. And then in the public key world, they don't have this, okay? So now the challenge becomes tougher because now you have to enable secure communication between Alice and Bob, but now you don't have the luxury of this uh, secure channel, okay? So it turns out that over the past sort of 40, 45 years, what cryptographers have observed is that the symmetric crypto world is much easier to build you know, it, it consists of really simple structures and really it turns out that they are very often quantum safe, okay? So this is, this is, this is you know, sort of fascinating. On the other hand, in the public key world, this is completely different, okay? Public key crypto is much more difficult to build, okay? Um, it has very, very complex, very specific structures that you see manifested in that world and many of them turn out to be quantum broken, okay? Which is, which is the whole point of this, uh, of this talk, okay? So one of the things that I've been really interested in or fascinated by is the structural gap between the two worlds. And the question is that can you have like a systematic framework that explains this, okay? So this, this is true, okay? This has been there for the past 40 years or so, but can you come up with, uh, you know, uh, an explanation for this, okay? Now, of course, what you might ask, why do we need an explanation? And I'll try to motivate that. The way we have been sort of building public key cryptography and this is partly the reason why we are in trouble, is that we have sort of tried to build it from as many different assumptions as possible, okay? And this is fine, because you might say, okay, tomorrow if you break assumption one, I can still fall back on assumption two, okay? And that's okay, right? But the problem is that in the process, we have developed many, many different techniques for doing things, and it almost seems like every time you want to switch assumptions, you start from scratch, okay? So, this is a problem in quantum safe crypto because when you want to sort of move towards quantum safe crypto, it seems like, okay, so I had like a bunch of crypto, you know, in purple and green, right? That was very nice. And now it's suddenly broken, right? And now I have this problem where I have to build everything from this blue assumption, right? Ignore the details. The details are not important. You can just focus on the colors. But there are these N advanced crypto systems that I have to build, okay? And now I have to sort of start building all of them from scratch, okay? So maybe I knew in the 1980s how to do something from maybe the purple assumption. Now in the 21st century, I have to again start building it from scratch, okay? So in some sense, you are reinventing the crypto wheel every time your assumptions break, okay? And this is not a great state of affairs, okay? So this is where we have been doing some work over the past five years or so, where we have sort of been trying to make sense of this crypto jungle in some sense by having a much more systematic framework that sits between assumptions and your target primitives, okay, or applications, okay. And this framework essentially consists of simple symmetric crypto which gives you some basic, you know, hardness properties. And on top of that, you can have some very simple algebraic structures which actually somehow explains what you need on top of symmetric crypto to actually get these public key primitives, okay. Now the advantage here is that you can have your assumptions on the left, you can have your primitives on the right, but really it's this framework in the middle which makes things simplified because you can use this framework to build all your advanced crypto systems and then you can sort of take your assumptions and build this framework in the middle, okay? So in some sense, you, you sort of get rid of all those you know, nasty looking crisscross arrows, right? And it becomes very simple and very unified, okay? 
Now I want to talk about two implications of this. One, which has a complexity theoretic flavor. I'll not have, of course, time to go into the details. Um, so I'll keep it very high level. And then one for quantum safe crypto, which I really find you know, very, very interesting. Um, the first one is the following, right? So you know, cryptographers, we like to play around with structure and hardness, okay? So in some sense, this framework gives you this, this play tool, right? Where what you can do is you can take your favorite symmetric crypto assumptions, and you can take your favorite algebraic structure, and you can start playing around with them, okay? And what happens as a result is you sort of start seeing that with different assumptions and different kinds of structure, you end up having some magic, right? And you actually start realizing all these advanced crypto systems, okay? So all of these advanced crypto systems that you know, you've been, have been built from n different assumptions, you can actually have a very unified picture where you can explain them in terms of algebraic structure, okay? Of course, this is very high level and abstract. And I thought I'll keep maybe one slide for the cryptographers in the audience um, where I, you, know, you can ignore all of the details, right? Because none of this is probably legible to anybody in any case. But what I want to sort of uh, highlight here is that what I'm talking about in this slide is 40 years of cryptography, okay? And I can explain this all, right? We can explain this all in terms of structure and hardness, right? The more structured you have, the richer your primitives become, right? And, the, and in varying your hardness, you essentially get various kinds of primitives, okay? And this, the ones that are sort of, you know, inside these blue boxes are what you need, what enable all of these nice things that you do, right? right? So for example, when you do privacy preserving analytics, when you do collaborative analytics, when you do, you know, simple things like sending a WhatsApp message, okay? These are the primitives that you need, okay? And now you can explain all of that in terms of structure, and hardness, okay? So that's one aspect of it. And the reason why I say there's a complexity theoretic aspect to this is because you can now relate these primitives, you can have sort of a complexity theoretic hierarchy where you can rank these primitives based on the amount of structure needed to build them, okay? So that's one way of viewing things. And the other aspect, of course, is sort of more related to quantum safe crypto and is perhaps more relevant to the motivation I gave which is that now with this sort of, you know, framework in the middle, when you want to sort of, you know, have quantum safe realizations of various primitives, instead of building n different primitives, you can just think of building this framework in the middle, okay? So you essentially reduce realizing so many different things to just realizing the right structure and hardness combination, okay? And that's a much nicer thing to have because then you can just focus on that and you can sort of, you know, you know, burn through all the math you know, and try to figure out some assumptions that you think will are plausibly quantum safe and will give you the right structure plus hardness combination, okay? And uh, in some sense, therefore, you avoid reinventing the crypto fee, and which was the motivation, okay? And here I will just sort of conclude the technical part with this one slide, um, which again is perhaps more relevant for the crypto folks, which is that in some sense, this framework allows us to examine various kinds of cryptography through a unified lens, okay? So cryptography that looks very different. You know, if you are, if you are familiar with maybe Diffie-Hellman, right? And then, you know, some of the crypto folks in the audience perhaps know about, you know, lattices, for example, right? They look very different, but when you put them in this lens, you realize that they are essentially the same lens, okay? It's the same structure plus hardness lens. And then the other advantage is that now you can start taking new plausible assumptions, right? Instead of putting all your eggs in one basket, if you want to diversify your assumptions, then you can plug in new assumptions into this framework and it supports that, okay? And we did that, for example, with, with isogenies of elliptic curves, okay? So I decided to keep it at a high level because of lack of time. I don't really have time to go into the details, but you know, I'll be happy to chat about it offline um, or you, know, you can take a look at some of the work that, you know, some of the papers that we have had in the past few years. So I'll probably end um, by sharing some observations I had. Um, you know, Arpita and Karthik insisted that these should be there. Um, I'm not, I, I have to say this is the first time I'm presenting slides like this. So I'm in uncharted territory and I don't even know if I have the right set, you know, experience to be able to say these things. Um, but I thought there might be some things that perhaps would be helpful. Um, to, you know, young researchers, you know, PhDs, early career postdocs. Um, so my experience, um, you know, has been very sort of diverse because 
Um, so first of all, I have sort of moved around quite a bit. Okay, so I started out as an undergrad and a PhD at IIT Kharagpur. I did a postdoc at ETH Zurich. Um, I did quite a few internships during my PhD. In fact, I spent around 40% of my PhD um, away from my institute. Okay. Um, and the entire body of work that I presented here today, for example, was done without my advisor. So I've actually had um, the wonderful experience and guidance of many, many people who are way smarter than me, and, uh, you know, but, but they cared about teaching me, right? And I think that's, that's something that I've taken away. Um, I think some of these things were said by, told by the other speakers as well, and I don't want to repeat them. Couple of things I want to highlight is that I think when you choose a problem, right, uh, to work on, you should really care about that problem, okay? Don't choose your problems because that's the area where it's easy to publish. Don't choose your problems because your friend wants to work on that problem, okay? Or don't even choose a problem that, you know, your advisor told you is good to work on, or purely that's the reason why you're working on it, okay? You should care about the problem that you're working on. And the other thing that I want to say is that collaboration is great, okay? So I love collaborating with people. In fact, a lot of the times, the collaborations mean more to me than the work, okay? So you build wonderful relationships working together. It's very easy to forge, um, you know, friendships, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful feeling to be part of a community, and that's what I think research has given me, okay? Um, and I'll sort of end with a few things that some of you may be going through, and if you are, then you're not alone, okay? All of us have gone through these things. All of us have had, you know, failures, rejections, um, difficult choices to make. Um, I myself gave up, um, you know, a, a, a corporate job when I joined PhD. Um, and uh, I think there are some healthy practices that get you through this, right? And I always encourage people to talk about your research. In fact, somebody, I think, uh, Moinakda was mentioning to me that there's a fear that if you talk about your research, your ideas will get stolen. They don't get stolen, they get refined, okay? So, so talk about your research with people, know what others are working on, Embrace your rejections, be open to different choices, and at the end of the day, take ownership of what you're doing and roll with it, okay? So that's all I have to say, thank you.